Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for a big wrap-up of all the sort of news that have been around the traps for the last week and a half. I feel like we haven't done a podcast in about a year. Oh. Uh, we've got Tour de Romandie, Tour of the Alps, formerly called Giro del Trentino, uh, transfer rumours, a Netflix Tour de France trailer drop, lots of different things before the Giro d'Italia kicks off in less than a week. How's your packing going, Benji? My packing? Am I supposed yeah. to already have started packing? I usually do that two hours before I leave. <laughs> well, the weather here is pretty variable, so I pack oh, between minus two and 30. Wow. I'll survive. I'll figure it out. I'll survive. You might not. Hey. If you sleep outside in minus two, I think you die. <laughs> I, I can't wait to though. be back with you, though. <laughs> We're going to make some good content, I feel. It'll be good. Anyway, Tour de Romandy first. It's a six-stage race with a prologue. Two time trials, including the prologue, which is 6.8 Ks, and then there's a 18.7 kilometer very hilly time trial on stage three. There's one mountaintop finish. I've got to be honest, this race, the reason we didn't cover it uh, daily is because it's in a weird slot in the calendar now where the, the big Giro contenders, it's way too close to the Giro to do it. And in fact, two Yumbo riders left the race two days early with, um, what was it? light possible sickness Hessen yeah. and Foss who go to the Giro um, and it's too far away from the tour for the tour guys to be tuning up here they're all about to go to altitude in about 10 days so it's in a weird spot in the calendar and but we don't have the big six here um, could there have been a maybe a puncher circuit that would have made one of the stages a little bit better possibly we do have hater here though both for the TTs and the climbing sprinty boy sprints <laughs> which we have a plenty, but he is the favorite, I think, for stage one, Benji. But it was Cherny winning the prologue by a second ahead of, well, less than a second ahead of Foss. Joseph Cherny, probably on all of 70 grand, wins <laughs> his, he's won, that's his second World Tour race because he won the, he won the Giro um, protest stage, right? When they restarted from a break. He did. You're right. He certainly did. The thing with Journey as well is like he was a solid charm trialist when he was riding for CCC. I recall that he was riding the Velta yeah. and it's some good like rolling time trials. He was good at those rolling longer time trials. And when it comes to these shorter prologues, he had completely skipped my radar, like in general for a stage like this, because in the past, like he's not riding all out in most of them these days. And also with Roman D, there's so many other riders that are here that could potentially have done great here and Cavagna's name that pops up for stages like this, but it's also a factor of like, he hasn't done it recently. He's more grown into this GC group of riders where I was like, mm, is he actually going to be able to pull it off? So I was thinking, yeah, Hater should be a, should be having a pretty good result on the stage. Maybe a Foss could do pretty well or World Championship Tram Trial should be able to compete against outsiders for a time trial, I would guess. And also the other riders like a Sobrero, who we usually see in the Giro doing well in the last time trial, I think. Was it last year or the year before where he did really well? And that's kind of the names I was looking for. And I was hoping to see whether we would see a, a Fisher Black maybe do a good time trial. Because he had that serious injury last year. But beforehand, I recall that he had... Was it a time trial where Remco got beaten by, by Herregots in the Balwaza Belgium Tour? Where Finn Fisher Black podiumed? I Very think vague memory. Balwaza, yeah. And UAE put him and Björg in what we thought were the optimal slots. So they were in the slots that all the other top GC contenders were in really late in the prologue because there was a bit of rain about. DSM went early with Poole and Bardet. Looked like a good choice in hindsight. Don't know if the wind changed, but they said good times. And yeah, Cherny wins. Foss would have won, would have, should have, could have, but he stuffed the last <laughs> corner. He braked like 150 meters too early and ends yeah. up losing by 0.25 seconds and... That was that. So big upset, Cherny winning. Hater, I was surprised. Like to come sixth in a prologue with his profile, his power, his setup, I was surprised. Um, he would Should be better. Come back. Yeah, probably. But the Tudor TT setup must be okay if Suda's coming fifth. Of course, small gaps. One thing of note, though, that stood out was they used so the best of the real GC guys, if I'm not counting Sobrero, which I'm not. He only lost 12 seconds, and that was a step ahead of any other GC guy and he yeah. came here from 
like 250 days no racing because he's had tendonitis and a foot problem. And I was like, okay, at least his short punch is decent. On the other end of the spectrum, like I don't know if Foss is going to Israel or not, but they, I don't know if it's the riders, of course, Froome and, and Woods aren't the best, but like Woods lost in this TT and he was going for GC here, I presume. He lost 48 seconds in a 6K prologue and he lost 10 seconds to Sepulveda on Lotto Destiny. So, like, is that set up? Uh, it's just something. If they want to be a competitive team and they keep signing Rise for GC, they need to completely overhaul the TT setup yep. and also the programming for it because that is so bad that I'm not just buying, oh, well, Mike Wood's body shape isn't aerodynamic. Come on. Edward Sepulveda losing 10 seconds to him on a Ridley setup. It, like, I don't know what's going awful. on. Yeah, yeah, that's awful. And you know that if you start on such a back foot going into the rest of this race, then it's likely not going to end well in the coming stages. But the next stage was not a GC stage. So the next stage is stage one because the prologue is not considered a stage because reasons. First all sprint stage, and we get a sprint then. In there, I was expecting Ethan Hay to run. When it comes to the positioning of Hayter, we've seen the last run in that he switches from the wheel of a teammate. It might have been Martinez. I'm not sure about it. And he moves to the right side of the road, and he goes into the wheel of Ethan Vernon. And from that point onwards, with about 2, 1.5k to go, he like drops back and gets like pushed back because a lot of rider takes the wheel in front of him, and then another rider takes the wheel in front of him. So he gets destroyed by people taking his spot. Then we get a sprint between Vernon and Nays, and... Vernon destroys everybody. Nays afterwards said that he could have won the race, but I don't know how, because he's second. So how? <laughs> he, I don't riding know how faster. <laughs> yeah, maybe if Ethan Vernon didn't exist, which he did exist, <laughs> unfortunately, for him. So uh surprising to me was <clears throat> Gaviria getting dropped. Now I, I think if this was a Giro stage, I was like, mm, I quite like this sort of stage for Gaviria, but yeah. I guess it was like over, I don't know, it was like 10, 12 kilometers at over at 8%. That is hard, even though it is in the first third of the stage. But still, if Vernon made it, then I expected Gaviria to make it. And maybe it just depends on the climb because that will be flipped later in this race today. Um, but yeah, it's Hayter said afterwards or the next day, he needs a more thinned out group. And to be honest, I don't think you can pace too hard on climbs for Hayter. Hayter is... Like, un- he's called rally level climbing. His climbing is yeah, unbelievably good. I agree, but he seems to be the rider that does it from the last part of the group, and he stays at the back of the group most of the time on the climb. And can he get in trouble if the tempo at the front is too hard to the point that there's splits in the middle of the group? Because he needs to be at the front during that effort, right? He does, and in Basque Country, he was a little bit. I think that that can be more easily improved. I think than just yeah. saying hold the wheel in a sprint in 60 kilometers an hour. I think it's easy to be like, we're going to be in front position. You're going to be fourth wheel. We're going 22 kilometers an hour. You hold that wheel. Don't look at your power meter. You're good enough. And we're going to drop everyone else that can hit 1,000 watts in this group. And but it, yeah, the problem is as well, Ineos team here, Bernal was unbelievably good, but like they got passengers. Viviani... Uh, and worth and who else is here like rivera's okay but worth's just gruppetto all day viviani's gruppetto all day rivera's fine but a lot of load on castro and Narvaez. and i don't know where hyduk is if he's injured maybe he probably doesn't get over the climbs anyway but this ain't tour to hungary and it's a world tour race and ineos is sending Maybe I mean, maybe haters burned them too many times and he kind of did this stage. It's like, well, we're not sending a full team to support you. Yep, possibility. But there's also the factor that after the stage, I think it was before the next stage that Ethan Hater mentioned on Ethan Vernon that it's not essential to drop Ethan Vernon on the climbs, that he can beat him in a sprint if it comes to it. And um, this was like a, a little bit of a, uh, a little thing on Twitter because Ethan Vernon then responded, you should have sprinted on stage one then. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that was fun but anyway we get to that next stage we get to the next stage and we get another opportunity for hater another opportunity for the vernons of the world 
and maybe some other riders. Because in, in the previous stage, we had Bardet sprinting for a top five position. So the GC yeah. riders with some sprint can try and get some bonus seconds here. And we get towards that third sprint, uh, st- second stage. So the third race we see, first yeah. half sprint stage. And Ethan Hatry gets perfectly out by Ineos, right? Well, I want to go back. What were Yumbo okay. doing on this stage? I don't really question. know what their plan was because they got Foss in the leader's jersey, by the way, because mm-hmm. Cherny's dropped. So Foss is in, oh, no, he's in the points jersey. Maybe going into the leader's jersey. And they, Hersink does a huge pull from like the 5K, 5% climb, descent, valley, the, the next climb, valley, and then there's a 1.5k, 8.1% climb called Le Communal. And this one's actually close enough to the finish, the crest, 12k's. And there's another little rise, a 1k, 6% rise with 5k's from the finish. And I was like, are they going to go for Glog? Mm-hmm. Uh, is Crossfire going to do a lead out? And what happened was um, someone attacked. Jorgensen was following them. Someone, Woods attacked. Woods attacked. Yeah. Jorgensen follows, Glog follows. And Glog doesn't pull through, nose breathing. And I'm like, so what's the, the point? point? <laughs> you know, like, is Foss, uh, maybe they're just trying to defend so Foss could go into the leader's jersey for a day. But I would have, if Glog had the legs, go on with it there because it's not like they have a, a sprinter behind. Um, anyway, it comes back together. Yeah. Woods is probably like, why, why are you guys not working with me? Um, exactly. That and next to sense. that, by making that pull with Hesink and so forth, they make the race harder as well, which means that it's less likely that a, a pure sprinter will take all the bonus seconds, right? As in the top three spots? Exactly. And that's what happened with Ayuso coming second, which was a huge sprint. But yeah, it was literally GC guys plus Hater and Court was getting sort of yo-yo dropped. And he was technically in the sprint, but his, he had no legs. He'd just been chasing the whole time. So Hater wins out of Ayuso. Uh, and Hayter goes into the leader's jersey for uh, six seconds out of Foss. Maybe they were trying to drop Hayter for Foss to be in the leader's jersey for a day. I don't know. But um, anyway, next day is the 18K TT. Big upset. Not to me. Not to me. But <laughs> big upset. Juan Ayuso wins. Now, you're thinking, how has he won this? And then he gets cooked in the rest of the, the, the race. Well, it's like a 1,500-meter 7% climb. Falls flat for 3%. Then another 4.5K is at 6% or so. And then another little false flat ridge line. And then a very technical descent in parts on a TT bike, very steep, into Chateau Saint Denis. And are you so, you know, I think a lot of the GC top guys, you've got to have a little piece of your brain missing. And that's what makes them great. <laughs> and I think he's, and also fantastic handling, but. Some guys afterwards were like, I have a wife at home. I think it was Mikhail Bjork. I would like to see her afterwards. She literally <laughs> said that. And then is like, <laughs> F1 just finished in his way on. So he's a brilliant descender, went full gas, obviously, because he wasn't leading at the intermediate check before the descent. He did a decent enough climb five seconds or so behind Jorgensen, who was in the hot seat for ages. He wins a use of his first world tour race, five seconds out of Ye- uh, Jorgensen, and Yates on 17 seconds. Are you taking the lead? It's a crazy result, Benji, for Ayuso after such a long layoff. Exactly. And the thing I want to talk about for a second is his descending for a second because it's such a vital part to his victory here because that's where he took so much time on some of the other GC riders where is he the kind of rider which like Vincenzo Nibali was the kind of rider where his technique was so bloody good, his cornering, his handling going into that Chiviglio descent, for example, in Lombardia 2015. That was amazing. And when it comes to his daredevilness towards the end of the career, that kind of ruined itself. That kind of died out. When it comes to some other t- uh, downhill guys, like, for example, Aramburu is a daredevil in descending. Like, I don't know if he'll survive the rest of his career as he, if he keeps descending like that. But if we then take a look at Ayuso, would you say it's more the daredevil than the technique? Or would you say that it's a balance of both? It's got to be both in, to some degree. I think Pidcock too, like, you know, he's got good technique for sure, but he's also taking risks um, yep. because you can have the best technique in the world, but if you come around the corner and in the middle of the corner is a bit of gravel and you're, even if you're not touching the brakes, 
but you hit that at a slight angle off camber at 65, 70 kilometers an hour, who knows what could happen. Um, so just having good technique doesn't necessarily mean you never crash. But yeah, you so definitely, he, maybe he's like Uran. I don't know. Rodriguez Carlos is also quite a good descender, I believe. But decent GC gaps. It's a weird TT. These are weird time trials. <laughs> and the most recent one reminds me is the Dauphiné 2021 TT, which Lutschenko won. And also the Swiss TT, which was a proper mountain up, mountain down uh, Run. TT last year. He won that on the descent too. So... That's why we see three Movistar in the top five. The average speed's under 45 k's an hour. Jorgensen, Oliveira, Barta. And they have a performance engineer, technical guy, whatever you call him, even Velasco. He was at Astana when Luchenko won that Dauphiné TT in the big upset. He moved to Movistar. These sort of TTs seem to be a specialty. And you know what race has one of these? Tour de France. So don't be surprised <laughs> if Enric Mas does better than expected on that uh, Tour de France TT. Fully agree. And we notice that pattern between those two time trials. But when I start thinking then, when I start thinking about these two time trials and I start thinking about the preparation of such an arrow guy like Velasco doing the work for these riders, I'm like, where can the difference be made on a bike, on a setup, on the riders, on the recon, on the way the pacing plan works? Which area do you think is the most different from a flat time trial? Pacing? Pacing, yeah. Because pacing and recon of technical corners. So as the lowest as the average speed drops, Movistar get punished less for their bad equipment relative to Quick Step Bora and Co. and Yumbo. So you look at the prologue. The winner speed average is over 55 kilometers an hour. 55 versus 45 is very different. And if your helmet is not so slippery, you get punished less for it than the 45k an hour average TT. Now, obviously, they're not really changing too much equipment. Or maybe they are with wheel depth, I don't know, or tire pressure mm -hmm. between the TTs. But definitely pacing is like really, yeah, it's evidently really important. Um, because you're like, how much do you push on the climb? How do you really know if you have to pedal at all on the descent? Or maybe, like, do you need to save any watts? Do you just turn it into basically an 8K TT where you smash yeah. the climb and you're freewheeling because your technique's good? I don't know. Um, it's beyond me, but definitely teams have some have better guys for it some don't uh disappointing i would say was sobrero disappointed me in both was he sick i don't know he was poor I in both tts yep quite disappointing in both time trials especially the second one i will however turn it back for a second and complain about time trials in general why are the intermediate Checks always put in terrible positions in time trials in every bloody race. Yeah. Like even for the for the Giro, initially they have had set the intermediate check at the foot of the Monte Lusari, the last mountain time trial. They've now set it a kilometer earlier. Why? Why make it more difficult? Yeah, I mean that's that's annoying, but not as bad as this one is bad. Yeah, it's halfway up the climb. So yeah. it's like we just have to extrapolate the time loss for the rest of the climb. Um, but yeah, it's and you don't know you don't know what their pacing plan is afterwards either. Because if the nope. let's say the there's a time check at the foot of the climb and there's a time check at the top of the climb, and you then you know how fast riders went on the initial flat section on the climb and on the flat section at the end. And now we don't know that. Max Pool top ten in the TT. That is very encouraging. 20, 20 year old Britain on DSM and. Uh, other things I'd like to point out, Lenny Martinez was quite good. He said, great interview afterwards in English. And he was like, "Like, did you take any risk on this? And he said, no risk, absolutely no risk. And then he was like, actually, maybe a little bit of risk. <laughs> so he immediately became a fan favorite. Marco Brenner, 12th, is just a complete mystery to me. This is, if you don't know Marco Brenner, he's 20. He's been on DSM since 2021. He had the best junior season uh ever for someone not named Remco, like completely dominant junior season, jumped straight to 
uh, DSM, and he's been nursing an injury all year. The fact that he's been just racing world tour races with a chronic injury that hasn't been <laughs> fixed, which locks up his back um, under in road stages, is just I don't know. Like he did, he did Catalonia. I was in the car. He got dropped before Rudy Gazelle. Gone four k, four percent climb, like out the gate. Yeah, and I was like, "What's he doing here?" Finishes that, goes to altitude training camp. They then go to Romandy with this issue that's not fixed. He's under contract till end of 24. He's 20 years old. I don't know if it's his decision. If it is, it needs to be told. Like, you have a long career. You can ride as a GC guy until you're 40 years old. Try and get this fixed because you could bounce yeah. yourself out of World Tour. And, and obviously, the talent is still there because you don't run 12th in a world tour tt like this without talent so obviously he can do the power and the power is there but in the road stages there is something wrong um and i would say fixing that whilst doing altitude camps between world tour stage races is not in my not expert op- opinion the best way to do it yeah and in my not expert opinion i would say that i would guess that it would probably make the injury worse if you keep riding with the injury you have because you don't give it time to rest and so but then again i'm not a doctor so i'm just making this up as we go that's how we do it but it sucks because i would have liked seeing him progress from the previous years i've been looking forward to his career for years now and we're now at this moment where he's kind of like stuck he's stuck and it's annoying because it can't be good for his mental health either he must be suffering off the bike as well because of the fact that he's kind of limited now yeah, like he's got the engine, he's got the power, he's got the talent, but something's blocking it. Now, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe he's got to work through it, but it's just odd to me. Anyway, Ayuso goes into the leader's jersey, 19 seconds out of Jorgensen. Oh, no, sorry, a bit less than that, before the big <laughs> mountaintop finish, Tion yeah. 2000. This is a hard stage, 162 Ks, two climbs that are 14 Ks at 7%, and then they do the Tion 2000, 21 Ks, 7.6% average, 21. That is harder than, it's one of the hardest mountaintop finishes you'll see in cycling this year because the last, I think, 8Ks and 9%, it's a, almost as hard, maybe just as hard as Col de la Lowe's. And obviously, as the name suggests, it finishes over 2,000 meters. So big day, rainy conditions. Like you so said before the stage, I ain't got no chance. I've come into here, um, and he wasn't lying. He got dropped early. But Jaco Benji, you're a little bit curious. They had two guys in the break. I don't know if there was some <laughs> pissing contest in the break between Craddock, the Gent, and um, Jul Jensen. Jul Jensen. By the yeah. way, Craddock, 100% chance he gets in the break on stages he cannot win. Sierra Nevada, T on 2000. <laughs> Let's get in the break. <laughs> As a ruler. Grand Montana. It's happening. Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's noticeable because they're in the break with two riders and then we see at the foot of Tion 2000 that their team is taking over in the peloton and is starting to pace for Eddie Dunbar who has, let's be honest about it, the ugliest glasses in the peloton no, I've I like ever them. seen. Keep them. Keep them, oh. Come on, I man. I like being able to pick riders out easily. <laughs> That's true. That's actually true. <laughs> okay. So yeah, for that Harper's reason, in good pace. I'll allow Would it. you have done it this way? No, I don't think Jayco should be taking up the mantle at this point. I think you would try to keep Harper for later, Dunbar for later, and maybe do the reverse attack thing. Like when you have a yeah. reverse lead out in the sprint where your lead out, well, your sprinter opens the gap and the other one, a guy goes. If one of your second guys goes on the climb and maybe forces other teams to to chase it down and then respond from the wheel of the other leaders, then you can benefit out of this. And maybe if, if you're lucky, then Harper could do the same that what's the Movistar do it again? Rubio. Uh, Rubio. Uh, Rubio and Jais. That's exactly yeah. what they could have done. Yeah. Because they exactly. jumped when Bjerg had a mechanical. So UAE were just going to do Choo Choo, Novak, Bjerg, Finn Fisher Black, Maiko, Yates, right? But Bjerg has a mechanical and there's like a lull. And that's when Jaco took over. And I was like, if if Harper jumps in this power vacuum, maybe he gets 25, 30 seconds. And it's Chris Harper. But he's good, yeah. but he's Chris Harper. So maybe he gets that freedom, <laughs> you know? And the pacing, and the, the other thing is, now listen, it's Romandy, it's the preparation race for the Giro, maybe they're trying to see what Dunbar's got. You know, I, I accept that. You want to 
see what you guys got. I would say probably on prior evidence, even though he is in really good shape, he is in good shape here, Dunbar. I don't. It is not realistic to think you are going to just set a hard pace and drop Adam Yates with Teddy Dunbar. No matter, and I think you're not putting him in a position to succeed there. And being aggressive, the way they were aggressive, I think cost him GC positions because he could have been with Pool, maybe. But if you're jump setting that hard pace, you jump twice, you attack, you follow attacks yourself, like you're the guy. Compared to um, Keanu to Brooks Benji, he is like, I'm not the best here. Yeah. I am going to just follow Jorg and Yates and try and get my best result. Yep, yeah, that's true. When it comes to uh, when it comes to DSM in that group, we see that Max Poole and Bardet are both there. We see that only taking over and totally shreds the group. And Bardet starts like cross attacking, uh, attack, attacking first. And Poole's kind of the guy that that stays on the wheel at that point. Then. I like the fact that they equalize Max Poole with Bardet in their leadership here because we've kind of roasted them when it comes to Brenner still riding everything that he's currently riding. But when it comes to Poole, I feel like they're really handling him well and giving him opportunities, no? Well, yeah, because Aaronsman last year rode for Bardet and Bardet won GC at Tour of the Alps, right? Which we'll get to in a second. Um, but it did seem that way, that Bardet was kind of sacrificing for Poole, the 20-year-old. And now Bardet's not tuning up for the Giro like he was last year. So maybe because yeah. he's like, listen, this is a filler race before I do the tour. Young guy get a chance. And Poole was ahead of him after the TT as well. So the hierarchy had been established by that. But yeah, only shreds the group down to eight, nine guys. Gino Mater dropped. Blogue dropped badly with Kreuzweig and then somehow finishes top 10 in the stage. I don't know if there's a pacing or positioning <laughs> problem. But it was our mate, That was our Maida style. And Yates starts doing his heavy on the pedal style. These guys have attacked a few times and Yates is just like heavy. And each time he attacks, it's we're now on 10% gradient. He's not like snapping the gap open, but it's just like inching further Jorgensen off the wheel. And Jorgensen probably wants to ride this like a TT. Eventually, Yates just rides away from him. He was, I think, 12 seconds, 14 seconds behind Jorgensen on GC before the stage. He got bonies at the line, obviously. And Jorgensen just tries to TT. And I think Yates just, he baits everyone perfectly. He never goes full. He said afterwards, I was a little bit skeptical about the altitude and my performance. And so he gets the gap to 13, 15 seconds and he just holds it. And he's like, I'm not going to go quicker than that in case. And if someone jumps, which Pino jumps, big move late after Jorgensen's been pacing, Yates accelerates again. And then the gap to the Jorgensen group goes from 15 to 22 seconds. So I think Yates had this completely under control the whole time. I think so as well. And every time that Yates puts pressure on the pedals again, once he sees Pino in his in his back mirror, then Pino has the has the mindset of like, oh God, this this is going worse than I expected, this bridging. And that demotivates Pino, the actions that Yates is doing at the front. So really well done. And that's what we see in Jabal Hafid when he's always doing that stuff. That's what we saw on was it Tireno towards uh twenty twenty one? Tireno twenty twenty one, that mountain stage. Was that him or Simon? The Sassotero one in the COVID terreno. I think it might have been Simon. No, Fuck. don't quote me on it though. <laughs> I'm switching them around. No. <laughs> I mean, they might switch themselves around too. So Probably every now and then. That's our conspiracy yeah. theory from that. Well, we did it in the past, right? <laughs> you had that in the past, right? That they switched every time? What if Simon it just rocked? What if they both changed teams and Simon just rocked up to UAE and like Adam rocked up to say EF? Why where... are we not calling them Ricardo and Felipe anymore? Uh, That's well, the real question. Maybe they do the world. So. But yeah, <laughs> the Watts here were really big. Yates winning the stage seven seconds ahead of Pino. Caruso is in very good shape. He is a Giro sleeper. More on that in our Giro preview. Pool fourth, very big result for a 20-year-old who's eligible for like second or third year U23. Jorgensen fifth after doing you know, the lion's share of the chasing. Oterbrooks, another second year U23. <laughs> came sixth. <laughs> Bardet seventh. Bernal. You heard it right. La, 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 la. Egan Bernal, eight, 54 seconds back. Now, that doesn't sound too great. Dunbar, um, ninth globe, 10th. They went two minutes quicker than Woods and 
Thomas in 2021. Over two minutes. Now, that was freezing conditions, I grant you. But still, this was a hard stage before. A lot of kill duels before. And they went really, really quick. This was career-level performance for this duration for Pino, for Caruso, for Caruso and virtually for Egan Bernal. Like, and, and you have to adjust that because everyone should be doing better than their 2019 numbers. If you're not doing better than your 2019 numbers, like Kreuzweig, like Buchmann, it means relative to the others, you're actually doing worse because everyone has gotten quicker since 2019. But still, this is a great performance from Bernal and everybody really, but I did not expect him to run top 10 in this finish. Nine seconds behind Bardet. Exactly. But it's also the fact that I would have been happy if he was just able to be a functional teammate again for Ineos. And he's been able to work a bit in the past. And now he's actually proving that he can still fight for top 10s in GC in certain races. And will that even grow further to the point that he can once again compete for victory in races? I don't know, but I'd love to see it. I would like to see it. If you can top 10 a Romani stage, you might be able to win a, a World Tour Grand Tour stage from the break. 100%. 100% he could. Vuelta, some of you, some of the Vuelta stages are really nasty. And he came eighth on GC here. And it's probably not going to be... But after his crash, and the sort of the crashes and bad luck at the start of the season, to come eighth in a... I know it's not the biggest field, but top 10 in a GC, a World Tour race with two TTs, I think Bernal is looking pretty good. And... Yeah, I think he'll go for GC top 10 at the Vuelta. And that's more yep. than realistic based on this shape. Um, but anyway, Yates goes into the GC lead. The last stage was, I didn't really like it, to be honest, because I don't <laughs> think it was, well, I think there needs, let me describe it, 170 Ks, there's a 6K, 7.5% climb with 100 Ks in, and then there's another 3.5 Ks at 7%, and it's like rolling flat downhill for the last 50 Ks. I think there needs to be two hills near the finish, um, on this stage, we've already had some climbing sprinty boy stages. We've already had a sprint stage. There needs to be something for the break, and or at least the punchers uh, in this finish. And but there wasn't. I think mostly I like to see Grand Tours undecided until the last stage. Well, World Tour stage races undecided until the last stage, and. With this one, you've kind of got like a sprint stage that finished it off. And I would like, for example, for this stage to have, like you said, a hill towards the end, also because of GC, because then there's still an option that someone tries something, you know? Yeah, like, mate, does Jorgensen try a launch? If there's a 1K 10% climb and, you know, Yates has to defend or whatever, you know, yeah. most of the time nothing happens, but at least people are trying. And with this parkour, it didn't. And so basically, teams tried to. I think Ineos could have probably launched the first climb a little bit harder, given how Hater, by the way, he came top uh, 26th Three? on... He beat Ayuso on T on oh, 2000 yeah. with all the climbs. So Hater's long climbing is ridiculously good. And I don't even... I presume he's going full gas, but I reckon he can go even quicker than that. So they could pace harder. And they drop Vernon. EF and Movistar and Bahrain start helping because there's... No, Gavira was initially dropped and came back and then Movistar started helping because Vernon's the quickest man he's dropped. Ineos stop helping once Gaviria is back because uh, then a counter break goes with Bouchard and uh, the Tudor boys. Was it? Yes. Kluckers? Suter and Kluckers, I think. Or Reichenbach. Or maybe it was Suter. Oh. Doesn't matter, right. really. BMC, I think... To be fair. To show it. With Reichenbach, if we see a bridge and we see the descent and we see him descend that bridge, we would notice if it's Reichenbach because he's one of the worst descenders in the world as well. Yeah. Anyway, they get caught by Nelson Oliveira and UAE pacing for Adam Yates to the three-kilometer mark. And then there's a sprint with a right-hand bend. We've had a lot of straight roads and a right-hand bend in the last 250. And it's a long sweep, a high-speed right-hand corner. We see a lot of fighting between Luca Mozzato, between Menton, between... Uh, where is he? Yeah, Zana was fighting tooth and nail for Hader's wheel and doesn't top 20 this sprint, like, or contest it. And Court's coming up, the EF have been pacing, but then Gaviria from fifth wheel, no lead out, launches super early, like he did in UAE. And the problem there was, it was a straight sprint, 
and there was Dylan Gronerweg and Sam Wilsford, Fabio Jakobsen, all the best sprinters. Here there's a corner. Here Milan Menton doesn't have the peak watts of Fernando Gaviria, and so there's a gap. And so jumping early, whilst it's a huge disadvantage when you don't get people off your wheel, once you have the gap and then the person chasing you is essentially slowing everyone down, like yeah. aunt and hater, the stage is over, especially when you're the best sprinter anyway. And Gaviria cleans it easily. Exactly. And we see this kind of moves a lot by Gaviria, where I recall the stage win of Sagan in the Giro two years ago, yeah. or last year, whatever it was, was probably two years ago. That was also similar. It was also where, where a corner was really early, and then Sagan was able to follow, because he has the technique, while Milan Menton doesn't have the technique of Sagan to go through the corner to follow Gaviria in the same way. But then he sometimes tries on, on like straight roads, and that's where it becomes more difficult, because you don't have that technical moment where someone will slow down behind you, where you can build up an advantage, and that's what happens here. Now, I will quickly say that we see Sobrero in the top 10. Maybe Zana was there to position Sobrero, because they don't have that oh, many okay. options to position riders. But I will say Mozzato should probably called should probably be called elbow man after the stage, the way he was elbowing left and right <laughs> in the positioning of the stage. But hey, he's good at positioning, but it, come, yeah. it might come at a cost at some point. <laughs> this was curious how Vernon got dropped on this stage, but came back on the other stage and Gavira yeah, got but, dropped on the first one. And then Quickstep tweeted that he was back with 20k to go in the peloton, oh, did they? but I, I didn't thought he see was him. back. Was he? No, he wasn't back. He finished four minutes down, but <laughs> three seven irons and uh, Cherny had been pacing for him, but they just weren't able to bring him. They ran out of gas. Castro Viejo, I think, killed them off. I would have liked to have seen something for the break for someone like Harry Sweeney or versatile riders, but not to be. GC, Adam Yates takes it out. His second GC World Tour win in Europe after winning Catalonia on Ineos in 2021 and after a tough start to the season with a vet on stage one of Catalonia he had a very hard crash in San Felipe de Gijols uh that was only a month ago for him to now win Romandy I think the team will be very very happy with that and with Ayuso and his stage win Jorgensen second 19 seconds back that's his best world to a GC result and Movistar frankly that's a very good result for them, plus the last stage. They will be very happy. Caruso, third, 27 seconds. Pool, 38 seconds. DSM had a very, very good race. Pool is a serious guy. Um, then Pino, great to see him in the top five. He's doing the Giro, I think. Oterbrook, sixth. Bardet, seventh. Bernal, eighth. Mike, uh, Dunbar, ninth. And Micah, in service of Yates, tenth. So there's a lot of good news stories, I would say. In this top 10 of GC, with Yates coming back, with Jorgensen showing promise, with Poole and Bardet, with DSM performing well, with the young guys. So, yeah, there wasn't the most enthralling stages, but I, I do think it was a nice hit out, and I always like to see the one-hour uh, long climbs. There was... Yep. Uh, any other news from this race, Benji? I feel like a lot of people had COVID the last week in cycling. No? Yeah, well, that's just Ardennes, right? Yep. That's just the Liège and everyone gets sick it's from it and feels rubbish after it. Yeah, Chicone's out of the Giro. That's, that's going to be devastating for him, but health comes first, as the Trek press release said. Um, there was Jorgensen, Jumbo, Visma rumor, I think, the morning of Tio stage? Uh, yes. Yeah, that that was in... What's, Ash, what's HLN, Benji? At last the news, the last news. Okay. Is it what's like the hierarchy of seriousness? You've got Sportser, Het Newsblad, Het Last the News. I'm running out of things now. Vila Flutes, I'm going to make enemies Belgium. if I respond to this, man. Come on. I would no, say no. that <laughs> if I had to judge Belgian media, don't quote Most me on this. Informed. Don't put Most this likely to be right. Most likely to be right? I don't really trust most of them. Uh, <laughs> I trust Vila <laughs> Vila Flutes younger well, u- news is like... <laughs> but that's Dutch, so that's the, yeah, wrong, side, that's the wrong side of the no, border. No, but Vila is a Belgian option. <laughs> yeah, Willer Flutes Belgium, but I'm not sure if it's made by Belgian people or by Dutch people. Anyway. I think they just... It's the same, right? It just changes the domain name. <laughs> and next to that, they like they like highlight the articles about Remco and about Belgian yeah. riders. <laughs> but the barely younger about, ones. Talking about lots of news for a second, there's a bit of lots of news where I'm like, I'm not really fond of the fact that a few of it is like clickbaity. 
Like a lot of it is clickbaity, but that's what most media these days when it comes to traditional media and so forth. And sometimes there's YouTubers out there that do it as well, but I don't want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> Go through Raiders' life. Yeah, I will clickbait the shit out of my thumbnails. No shame. <laughs> oh, but I'd say that I'd put sports up pretty high. Oh, really? Yeah, I'd put on sports the news are relatively pieces. high. On, on the news feed. Opinion pieces on every single one suck. Like, they suck. Damn, you can't. <laughs> didn't want to make columns, any enemies. Columns on news websites when it comes to sports only exist to trigger people. And the people writing it put something in there on purpose triggered. to trigger people. <laughs> and I'm triggered. Because, yeah. like, why does Lefebvre has a column? Because the people that have the newspaper know that he's always going to say something out of the ordinary that will trigger people. And then people will watch their news art- articles. Well, I think Lefebvre writing his column, that's sort of different to, like, Someone just, at least that's to someone in the sport, writing something original, even if it, yeah, offensive a lot of the time. Are you are you complaining time. about people outside of the sport making content about cycling? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying, you know. Anyway, they said you all So there was the Chiro tweet saying he was choosing between what EF and Yumbo, and then the had lots of news one said he might be going to Yumbo, but then the sports one was like as a classics domestic for Van Aert. It's <laughs> like Mate, you can't do this to me after I just said sports is pretty high up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the uh, analysis I guess. But yeah, after this, after T on two thousand, he's looking like a pretty good G C guy. But yeah, there can't yes. be any announcements. All these rumors, because there was also a rumor of Milan to Trek, I think. All these rumors can't be the teams won't announce them until August 1, I believe, is the cutoff uh, when they'll yep. announce for next year. But, yeah, he's obviously a hot man on the on the market. Matteo Jorgensen, an American getting a top top three in a World Tour GC race, is at his age, after his classic season, hot man right. on the market. The thing when it comes to Jorgensen's transfer and so forth, like the teams that are rumored, if he indeed goes to Yumbo, on one end, I think he will do well there. I think he will add to the team. But I would say... That it's kind of water running to the ocean. And yeah, so you tweet that. What does that mean? Well, the ocean is somewhat something that has a lot of water. And now there's more water running to the ocean. That I feel like there's a lot of talent going to the same teams while I would have liked seeing him. Yeah. While I would have liked seeing an American GC rider go to, for example, Trek Segafredo or something. But those guys are now after Jonathan Milan and throwing what what is it, a million rumored on the table? Yeah. But in other news, Retrek and young GC prospects, they parted ways with Antonio Tiberi. So that's not a rumor. That is, he's gone. And they said, it's strange because it wasn't just like we've mutually decided to part. Well, no, they said mutually decided to part ways because he made, because he just, he broke the terms of his suspension, which yeah. if I was his agent, I probably would have been like, we'll mutually part ways, but you can't say that. So yeah. I think the agents made a mistake there or is their lawyer. Um, and so the rumor is that he went on an Italian talk show and talked about the incident and he was not supposed to talk about the incident. You don't talk about Fight Club. You don't talk about cat killing with air rifles. So he's gone. It's just like, this is not the outcome they wanted. Italian, sub-25, TT, GC prospect. Where do you think he ends up? Probably a star or Bahrain. Those are the only yeah. two teams where I'm like, they will stand up and be like, welcome Tiberi in their home. They will first hide all the cats and then they'll welcome him in. Yeah. So, but that, I don't think he can sign anywhere again until August 1. You can't have, there's a yeah. mid-season transfer window of two weeks, August 1 to August 14th. And well, I don't know, it's weird. He should wait. be allowed to, but I'm pretty sure he can't. Are you sure? Because like no. riders that don't have a contract... Not sure. Should be able to transfer, I think. I think it's right. I don't know. I feel like, I swear it's, it should be able to. You should be able to, but I swear there's some UCI rule that if you were on a, um, a UCI team, you can't like mid-season transfer out of the window or change your team out of the window. Because this happened to um, Bogner. Oh. No, Bogner. Um, oh, with Alperson because yeah. he was on the Australian Conti team and then well, I don't I can't remember yeah but, but he was not terminated right or was he well they he cancelled his deal amicably oh. of course 
with the Australian team, but maybe not in time. Um, okay. But this is testing my memory. But yeah, it's August 1 is when all this stuff will come out. But Jaberi is gone and he's on the market. So at a discounted price, we'll see who picks him up. Otherwise, there was Tour of the Alps on. Now, that was a nice little nostalgia throwback. It was good for a while. I quite liked it. Um, it was a throwback to 2012 to 20, sort of 19. It was Skytrain. Yeah. It was like peak <laughs> Skytrain where Ineos had the best finisher on these sort of – those really long climbs, but none of them were at the finish. And stage one kind of – decided GC almost because there was a 5K 10% climb, but then a descent and then a long drag to the finish. Gegenhart, Ineos basically let him out for a sprint every stage and he won two of the first two of them. And after that had a GC lead of 18 seconds, which he nursed to the finish with Skytrain. So in moderation, I quite liked it. It reminded me of times past. <laughs> I think so as well. Now, when it comes to Ineos, it, it brings up questions, eh? Tao Gegenhardt doing really well. He's doing well on the first stage. He's doing well on most of the stages, obviously, because otherwise he doesn't end up winning this race afterwards, wins the first two stages, gets fourth on the fourth stage, and the last two stages were kind of breakaway stages, but interesting ones, I would say. I enjoyed the breakaway fights with Gar, Steinhauser, Mulberger, and so forth. I will, however, say Thomas Adams won Tao Gegenhardt. All three of them are rumored to go to the Giro. Like, there's no... I'm not sure if you know, Ineos has officialized their, their lineup yet, but that's going to be a curious one to discuss on the, on the Giro preview because Adensman did not look great in, no. in that race. And then Hart said, oh, you, you should give him some time. And then it was something about pressure on him for riding with, with the big guns like Thomas and, and Hart, who have both had Grand Tour victories. Maybe that gives a bit of stress and so forth, but the Giro is coming and it's only in a week now. And... I don't know where Aronsman stands. Uh, so I went past him on the TT bike. Yes, no, two days ago. I was going very, very slowly. Um, so I, I still presume he's going to the Giro. Most of the Giro guys leave in a couple of days. Um, as a domestique, it'd be like they don't have many options, do they? To And, and I think... No, I think he'll do it. And I think he'll improve throughout the race. I mean, yeah. they just got to tell him, like, listen... And to, like, the pressure's not on you. It's on Thomas. It's on Gagan Hart. Um, it's on Sivakov. It's the, probably the first line domestic to perform. De Plus was in very, very good shape for Ineos. He, contract year, he was looking very, very good. He reduced the group a lot on the climb that Haig attacked. Haig also looked probably in his best shape since the Vuelta uh, 2021. He attacked and was brought back by Thomas in the Valley on Stage 1. So, not the... Uh, what else came out of this race? Yeah, Carthy, good. Camner and Laura had a good strategy on stage three. Gal, yeah, good. But he's always good here. Yeah, yeah. Tour of the Alps, the law. area, home area, Austrian guys. Yeah. So that's what is required. When it comes to Alps, it's also like the question of how valid are the results of Tour of the Alps and Romani towards the Giro. Because we've seen years where they are completely opposite of what happens in the Giro. And we've seen years where the winner of Alps actually does good in the Giro. And... To the point where I can't really predict who of the riders that do well in the Giro will actually do well in the... Uh, who did well in the Alps will do well in the Giro. And then with Gagan Hart, there's also the question... His TT has gotten better, I swear, compared to two years ago. But is it on the level to compete with the Remcos and so forth? Nowhere close. He's going to lose minutes in the time trials. So he's going to be on a back foot there and will have to do a lot in the climbing. So I think that's why Thomas is probably still one of the names that is on the higher lane when yeah. it comes to Ineos, even though Hart is there. I also, Gagenhart was good, but he, and the Watts were good in some of these stages, but he won in sprints from groups, small yeah. groups, but groups of five, eight, et cetera. For example, on the climb that Haig attacked, if Gagenhart just easily jumps with him and they ride away, they probably take a shitload of time. He still wins the stage. Yeah. He, if you really got diamonds, and you're that much better. And and the reason I say this is to be really serious guy at the Giro, you would think you need to be that much better than this competition at Tour of the Alps. And I mean, they, the Skytrain strategy worked to win the race anyways. But mm, 
I'm not convinced on the long mountaintop finishes, um, at least certainly not against Remco and Roglic uh, in the Giro and probably not against Almeida either. But still, yeah, Simon Kia, good result. Carthy second. He's looking good for the Giro. He's gonna, he said he's all in for the third week. Uh, we'll have more on that in the Giro preview. But, yeah, it's – the Alps is an interesting one that it's – I don't know, just Remco and Roglic avoided it, Rondi, they avoided. It's so different to like the tour where the Dauphiné is where people prepare seemingly at the moment, the way altitude camps are going. I wonder if how that affects, because I don't know the answer, who's doing it better, Yumbo, Quickstep, or Ineos with the Alps perform yeah. preparation. I don't know. Um, yeah, that was Alps. Uh, other news, Benji? Oh. Netflix trailer. Netflix trailer. To the France. To the France. The series that will come out on Netflix following now seven teams according to the description. Really? I swear it was eight teams I swear it was eight. beforehand. Unless I read the description wrong. So that's a great no, start I think to you're start right. with. Okay, so one of the teams must have either jumped off the boat or something went wrong with the footage of one of the teams. <laughs> <laughs> they just fucked the SD card corrupted. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Imagine. Can we have the 60 grand back? The SD card corrupted. <laughs> Legendary. <laughs> Imagine Can't if that it. happens. Anyway, that trailer came out. Was good responses, bad responses, responses from both sides. What was remarkable is the factor that the voiceover and this, well, the voiceover in the trailer started off with French, then switched to English halfway, went to French again, then English again. So was bilingual on the screen what's your take on that yeah so i got a little bit i i, I just put out i saw the trailer because I, I was one of the i was waiting on the tour de france official youtube channel yeah i like watched the premiere of it wait ready for it ready for it and i just banged out you know i was surprised i was i i think i said who's this who's this show for which i think is a legitimate question yeah and I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer either. So I'm gonna have a little bit of a debate about it. Going, I don't know my the coffee mug Benji, but I am gonna I am gonna not rant, just explain myself more, more than 140 characters because I had some feedback, of course, um, which I probably should have seen coming. I was like, who is this audience for? The French domestic market or the international market? A lot of which is Anglophone, um, or at least Anglo speak English second language, and. I think what I really meant was I was surprised at how the trailer sort of didn't have Bora in it, didn't have Alperson in it, didn't have EF in it. And, you know, the, the feedback was like I had, um, when I was given a copy of Lane to watch in school, I'd taken it, put it in the DVD player, saw it had subtitles, when I thought Vincent Cassel was going to be, you know, doing his laser dance in English from Ocean's 12 and, oh, my God, it's actually in French in La Banlieue and I've, I've punched a hole in my TV because I just cannot deal with French language. That's not what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I was saying. I was just saying from a marketing perspective, I was surprised at the editorial choice. Yeah. Now, then I thought about it and I went back because I went and re reread the initial Netflix announcement and the ASO announcement and they said they're trying to broaden the audience. Now, broaden the audience could also mean broaden the audience within the geographic heartland but by age demographic. That's, I think, uh, if I was the ASO, there is an argument to be made that, listen, the international market is important but also the French market is pretty important too. It is, and it's probably skews older. And we can yeah. try and target the younger French audience. I agree with that. But when I go to Netflix and I open up that website and I, I hover over a, over a series that I want to watch to watch a trailer, it starts a trailer. And when I hear French on it, it depends. I, I speak French, so it's shit. But I do speak some French. As a, as a Flemish guy, you need to. So I will hear French. If I'm like an American 30-year-old, I'll be like, oh, it's in French. I'll watch something else. 
I think a lot of people will skip it because the trailer starts in French. And I hope the Netflix trailer starts in English in regions that are not primarily French, just to make sure that it broadens the interest initially and the click-through rate to the actual series, because that small factor can actually turn quite a few people off the show. That being said, I think despite our criticism towards like the editorial choices or our, our questions about the editorial choices, I think we both want this to succeed so bloody yeah, much. Yeah, of course we do. Because we want, We're both we want self-interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, of course we do. Yeah, we like we want the community. Imagine if the podcast to... audience tripled and we didn't have to do anything. It just tripled and we didn't do anything else. I don't know why people are like, oh, I don't want new fans coming to the sport being annoying. Ah, get them all in. I w- <laughs> yeah, like, of course, we do the same thing as we've always done and get quadruple. The F1 podcast, they must be laughing. Um, and of course, it's not going to be the same as Drive to Survive, but. And have that impact. But like we're coming from a place we want it to succeed. We're not like, oh, first of all, we don't release, at least I don't think we do, documentaries on Netflix. So it's not competing. <laughs> we want it to succeed. Of course, selfishly, I do want it. I would want it to be at least somewhat catered to the international audience. And this, the audience of this podcast is not just from Anglophone countries. It is from everywhere. It is a global podcast uh, audience. We love you very much. But to your point, Benji, going back to it, it is curious because then I was like, because then they use Steve Chanel as the voiceover. And I was like, is the show going to mostly be in French? Which, as I said, if that's the choice to target domestic younger audience, I think there is an argument for that. That is probably not the basis on which six of the eight non-French teams signed up to do it. And if you yeah. want them to sign up again they won't if you do that but it but then plugger said it's mostly in english yeah and so I, that's where it's curious you start in in french and then the show is in english and also i don't again i don't really have a problem with saying french use david godu behind the scenes if you want to go younger french audience use yep. david godu with all that behind the scenes footage you have on Discord, complaining about the Mar. That's lovely content. We want to see that. But <laughs> I would say also when it comes to the editorial choices of what has been shown, I feel like they went for the all cycling's awesome, badass riders on bikes kind of team. It's so hard. And it's difficult to balance that because you want to try and balance if you're making a show like this probably on the newcomers uh, to the sport. You want to get new people in, but you also want the existing audience to to feel for that. And I think the existing audience, the mainstream existing audience will see that and will be like, oh, this looks cool. I want to watch it. I think the newcomers, it depends on whether they have the open-mindedness of exploring a sport that they haven't seen before, which I have difficulties with that. I won't lie. Also because a lot of people might not have the time to watch that many shows, so they're selective on what to watch. But when it comes to existing hardcore fans, like us, for example, what I missed was the kind of behind-the-scenes content in the trailer where I was like, ooh, I'm going to learn something more about the behind-the-scenes instead of just a team manager looking at a screen in a bus or Pinot walking in between two buses. The Drive to Survive trailers had a lot of behind-the-scenes content of like even the funny stuff, like the riders clapping with the clapper board at the start, knowing that you're going to see some humor that's behind the scenes that you didn't see already. And I don't know, that's something that I personally missed. Well, because, okay, the point of these documentaries, right, because ASO, if you take all their footage from the Tour de France and their, like, arty highlight videos, which are quite good and they have a lot of unseen footage, and you stick them all together, you pretty much have, like, a in-depth race video. The point of these documentaries, and listen, I don't even know the rules of F1. What the fuck is a sprint race? But I like watch all the hot. Seriously, I don't know. I asked that to my girlfriend last week. I was like, is that just like a separate thing? But apparently it influences the other races. I have no clue what's going on. I don't know. But I watch all of Drive to Survive. You know why? Because it's not about the race. The race is just a vehicle for drama and creating personal connections. I can name all the drivers on the grid, all 20. Yeah. Because you have a, you know, their personalities, all what funny things they've done. And it's about creating personal connections with the riders. And I think to not have a writer speaking in the 
yep. trailer. Listen, it's just a trailer. It doesn't really matter, but listen, we it matters. Last time before the Giro. Okay, it matters. Um, where I'm, I'm overanalyzed, but Drive to Survive Season 1 trailer has Daniel, a shot of Daniel Ricciardo's mother as her, her – you take that behind-the-scenes content of the mother of a driver, which you never see on an official broadcast, saying, I just pray for a safe race. I don't care. And then it shows a fucking huge pile up. You're like, bang, and then it's silent. Whereas if it's just like, you know, a manager being like, yeah, the race is very hard. They're all warriors. Like, sh- I, and I know because, by the way, the structure of the show is it follows each of the eight teams for an episode each. There's two riders selected from each of the teams, and they also interviewed friends and family. That's the content you want to tease to tug on the emotional heartstrings. Exactly. Now, when it comes to this trailer, I also want to mention that I recall there being a trailer leaked a few months ago, two months ago, roughly, or something, a month and a half ago. And that trailer was basically a longer version of the one that now got released with clips in it from Strade Bianchi and so forth, from like other races that ASO does not have the license for and the show probably also doesn't have the license for because it's not in the final trailer. But then we see that there's a, a segment in the, in the new trailer of a crash from like two, three years ago from, I think it was a, an anti-mache rider or something, and in the background you see like a Sunweb rider, and I'm, or a, a giant rider, Sunweb giant, whatever, and I'm like, aren't there enough footage of crashes in last year's Tour de France that you need to go back three years to make interesting enough trailers for the Tour de France and chain 2023? And for that, I'm scared that they will use out-of-context stuff of previous years to make certain scenarios happen in this Tour de France and change show. Maybe. I mean, yeah, crash bait has its place to at least illustrate the danger of the sport. I think you can't shy away from it, but you need more than just crash bait. You need teammates who hate each other or don't get along <laughs> or are competing for the same goal yeah. or teams that have good camaraderie. And what was curious about that leak trailer is it it did have – listen – it had, it had the American team EF. It had Vorters speaking. It yeah. had the English language talking head. Orla was in that trailer. And in the official trailer, all of those bits, G speaking, Orla speaking, Vorters speaking, they all got ripped out. Yeah. So that's why I was it, like, this, that was weird. Is it because this is a Netflix France trailer and the English speaking trailer isn't out yet? Is that an option? I mean, I... I don't think so. Now, there can be – it could just be like the teaser and then you have another trailer and it's coming out June 8th, which is in just over a month. Um, so there could be another trailer, I guess. But um, I think you're right is that Drive to Survive was done by Box to Box Productions, clues in the name, Box to Box Productions, F1, English company. They did Drive to Survive. Now, they then were extremely successful – and leverage that success to get licensing agreements with many sports organizations, uh, tennis, golf. golf, something else, and cycling. And say, hey, look what we did Rugby. for F1. Yacht, uh, Mrs. Rouge says yachting, sailing. I'm sure about yachting. Sailing, let's say sailing. Didn't even know it was a sport. America's Cup, come on. Um, <laughs> no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> look what we did for F1. We can do that for your sport. But then the production of this to me has gone to Netflix France and it's a dual production with Quad, a production company in France called Quad. And how much input and say box to box are doing? Now I would dare say, putting my cynic head on, they're still doing Drive to Survive. Do you think the same people who are cutting up footage for Drive to Survive and have been since 2019 are doing the editing and everything and the storyboarding, the production for all these other franchised out shows, nah. especially because of the I expansion. Because yeah. if they're doing so many shows at the same time, Full Swing is out, Breakpoint is out, the Six Flags Rugby or whatever it is that sport with Six Flags thing. I mean, Six clearly, Nations. I only watch cycling. Six Nations, Six Flags is a, Six Get Flags is like a, an entertainment park, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Close enough. Are they doing Six Nations. Work? Yeah, so if all of this is happening at the same time, they're spreading themselves thin or they have expanded their team to the point yeah. that other people are doing other stuff. And how many shows failed for Drive to Survive to work? And that's I where I fear the, for it a bit. 
the golf, I don't think they like failed, but if they were pitched as going to be as good as Drive to Survive, yeah, they yeah. failed. I think the golf ones, all the hardcore golf people watched it, sailing yeah. or surfing. I'm pr- I presume all the hardcore people watched it, but these shows are kind of build like we'll expand your audience. And apart from Drive to Survive, haven't seen that. And like I love the Movistar one, um, Diamantes Pensado, but I, it might Only have grown in Spain people. a little bit. Pardon? Only cycling, cycling people that are already following cycling watch that, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe in Spain a few people. Um, but yeah. outside of that, no, nah, you, I think South be America, hardcore fan it's got a buzz. Yeah. True. True. And then, um, and that's why, Lopez. that's why the trailer doesn't hit me as hard because it doesn't focus on the riders as much. And that's also the danger because you're now focusing on eight riders or no, 16, no, 16 riders plus riders, Vingegaard. Oh, 14, 14 plus riders Vingegaard. plus Vingegaard because they didn't record Vingegaard in time, right? <laughs> No. That's the, the worst part of it all. They didn't get the winner. <laughs> they did Roglic and Van Aert as the two, I think. <laughs> like, I that's also guess. the danger of limiting it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But we'll see. Maybe the riders were boring. Maybe they didn't say anything interesting. Um, sometimes I'm pretty boring. Maybe most of the time. So nah. maybe they thought... And no, when you look at Drive Survive, the drivers are pretty guarded and they're like, we got to make the egotistical team managers who want to be the stars and have their time in the limelight. Horner, he's like, well, get me on camera. So Where's and the up and doesn't want to be on camera. Yeah. So maybe <laughs> that's why you see it like that. I don't know. This has been a lot of trailer analysis, but this is, I guess, a longer explanation of, yeah, my tweet, I was surprised. It's just different to what I expected. I, I yep. thought, to be honest, I thought, don't reinvent the wheel. If I was being lazy, I'd take the Drive to Survive trailers and I'd just take the exact frame concept and just copy it. The exact frame-by-frame frame concept that they have and just cut and paste it with the cycling scenes you've recorded and say, hey, great trailer. And then and the same sound. So when you see like Vingegaard yeah. attacking <laughs> Pogacar, you say, <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and, the, the f- and the radio voiceover, there's fire. <laughs> When someone crashes outside of the outside of the road, it's like a outside of the course penalty. <laughs> yeah, pit violation. <laughs> anyway. Pagasher on the descent of um before Altacam, you got a pit violation, <laughs> crashing the gravel. What's the thing when they neutralize the 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 safety cars? car? Safety car. At yeah. what point would that happen in cycling? Christian Prudhomme neutralizing the race. Yeah, true. When crash, the protests like happened two years ago, right? I asked you. It was the last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Betty all riding in circles. <laughs> that's what you remember. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened, right? And Wigan's putting the boot in. No, the director's... That was great stuff. Great scenes. Anyway, <laughs> let us know what you thought. Um, obviously, no series is made or break, break broken by its trailer, but, you know, that's all we've got to work on so far. <laughs> we obviously had thoughts because covering cycling in the media is, is our life, for better or worse, as how that sounds but it is we cover cycling every day and so we have thoughts but let us know what you think down below uh we'll have our giro preview we, we probably will record that and release it on tuesday afternoon because frankly the state of the confirmed start list is <laughs> like it's not abysmal yeah it's we're talking three teams here so we're hoping there's a big flurry of confirmations tomorrow afternoon and then we can record tuesday morning because right now it's too much guesswork to record on Monday uh, for a Grand Tour preview. Uh, so we're going to, unfortunately, probably do that Tuesday morning. Yes, sir. All right. Until then, ciao.